Good evening. There is a glory land waiting, isn't it? Isn't that a nice thought? A wonderful thought that somewhere after this life is over, we can go somewhere else. Because I don't know about you, but I can recognize pretty easily that that world is not here yet. Some man once said, the world is a bad place. There are many wonderful people in it, sure. But on the whole, humanity basically stinks. And isn't that just true? Because you look outside and you can see that as many nice people as you know, the general trend of society and the world at large is always downwards. As men go from bad to worse, always deceiving and being deceived and just heading downhill. Wouldn't it be nice if you knew what was coming in the future? Wouldn't it be nice if somewhere there was a plan laid out for exactly how the future of history is going to go? And maybe... Just maybe that's why the last book of the Bible is the great revelation, the one that lays out that path for the future. Turn to Revelation 6 and 7 this evening, if you would. That's where we'll be spending our time. I think Mike preached on chapters 4 and 5 today, and so we'll recap those very briefly and then head into this new territory. Before we go very far into this, I will say I don't believe this is a chronological plan for the future. I don't think this is John or Jesus specifying every uh, the seven stages until the end of time or eternity itself arrives or anything like that. But I do think that the basic message is one in which Jesus wins and one in which Jesus tells us kind of what's expected of us. In chapter four, you've seen a throne scene. That's what it's commonly called is God takes to his throne and John gets to see him and all of the the angels and the beings around him glorifying him. Then in chapter five, you see that same thing repeated, only not with God on the throne. You see it with Jesus as a lamb, signified as a lamb standing as if it had been killed, but it's back alive and it's here and he's here to do some work. There's a scroll or a book in chapter five, a book that cannot be opened. And all of heaven mourns as they can't get in and see the secret things of God until the lamb arrives. And then he takes it in his hand or hoof or however that looked, and he takes that book. And chapter 6 is where he proceeds to open those seals one by one. His death enables him to control these seals, whatever they are. And as he breaks them, we notice a couple of things. One, that problems are coming. And that's going to be undeniable. But number two, that hope is waiting one day for the faithful. Chapter seven is a chapter all about hope, and we'll get there in the end. But before we do, we have to go through chapter six because there will be a reckoning on earth. And that's where we start tonight. In Revelation chapter six in verse one, I'm going to read just uh, probably just chapter six right now, and we'll get to seven in a few minutes. Revelation 6 in verse 1. Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with the voice of thunder, come. I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and the crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come. And another, a red horse, went out. And to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth. The moon would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius. Do not damage the oil and the wine. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, an ashen horse, and he who sat on it had the name Death, and Hades was following with him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. Now there's a change. When the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw not another horse. But I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. 
And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord? Holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should wait, rest for a little while longer, until that number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed even as they had been would be completed also. And I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black, a sackcloth made of blood, and the whole moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree cast its unripe figs, then shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the commanders, and the rich, and the strong, and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Chapter 7 will be more pleasant than that. But only once we go through that first reckoning that's going to happen on earth. Before we get to the good stuff, before we get to the hope for eternity, before we get to all the happy times, there ends up being a time of trouble. And that looks like four different seals being opened and four different horses with different beings on them. Four different jobs, four different colors, all sorts of differences between these four as they go out, as they go and work in the world. But the one common theme you see in all of these is that Jesus is allowing all of them to happen. And I want you to hold to that because the things that they go through are not very pleasant, but Jesus allows all of them to happen. He's the lamb. He's in control of the book. He's the one opening the seals one by one and allowing these things out. At the end of the day, even though they're terrible, Jesus is in control and it will all work out. Firstly, we have a white horse. A white horse that comes out conquering and to conquer. As something is to come out and conquer the world, Jesus is allowing that to happen. Now, there are a couple different opinions on what this could be, and I'll just kind of give you both of them. I'm not sure where to stand. Many people say that this is the Antichrist, or at least the spirit of the Antichrist, because Antichrist is not one particular person, it's just kind of an idea, it's a teaching. And so maybe this is the spirit of rebellion against God. Maybe, on the other hand, this is Christ, or the gospel and the conquering power of God's salvation. And either one of these, I think, could be valid because ultimately they both serve the same purpose. Proof for the Antichrist might be looking at chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. And there you see a picture of Jesus, the Word of God, and those two pictures do not match. And so some people say, because those pictures don't match, they're both on a white horse, but this one has a bow, and Jesus in chapter 19, he has a sword. It's different. Jesus in 19, he has many diadems, and this one only has one crown. It's different. And so perhaps this is a parody of Jesus. Or perhaps it's not Jesus at all, but it is the gospel message. As it said, something similar to Jesus that comes out from him, thus they share the white horse, and they both work towards the same goal. Either way, the message is clear. Jesus is allowing a conquering force to do his work. I don't know if John is meaning to ascribe an anti-Jesus spirit to this or, or a pro-Jesus idea. I'm not sure. But either way, it's the same question. What are you being conquered by? In this world, do you give yourself over to the power of the devil and his message? Or do you listen to the gospel and allow and make your stand in God? It's a question that yeah, I don't know which one is which, and yet I know the question. Who are you being conquered by? Jesus wants to conquer anyone and everyone to come to his side. Satan's the same way. And he is also seeking to win people to his. Which one are you giving into? Which one are you grounding yourself in? Which one are you staying true to? Because that's going to determine where you fall within the next three. And ultimately, whichever this spirit is, the conqueror comes out and there, bring, there comes war with it. 
there's a red horse. Some kind of fighting, and many people attribute this to physical war. I don't think so. That doesn't seem to match with the rest of Revelation, which is about a spiritual conflict. It doesn't make sense that this would be about a physical war, a war in the world. Rather, this is seems to be a war against the faithful. Those who are conquered by Jesus fight those who are conquered by the devil, the enemy. And thus, this seems to be persecution against Christians as many try to take us away from the truth. People are going to fight each other. Jesus said as much when he came down, he didn't come to bring peace, he came to bring a sword, and families would be divided amongst themselves, the faithful versus the unfaithful, the believers versus the the heathens. We will not be on the same page. As life progresses, as this world keeps getting worse, what do you think is going to happen? We're going to run into differences. As Christians are attacked more and more, we haven't faced that much in this country, but it's coming. And you can see it, and you can even feel it in the air. Do you trust God as Christians start to undergo the same kinds of things that they do in other countries and that they did back in these biblical times? There's a spiritual war going on. And we are going to be part of it. That means there will not be peace. That means there will be war. Are you going to stay true to God through it all? Then a black horse comes. Starvation comes as the resources of this world are depleted. Again, many people ascribe this to, well, there's going to be a physical war, so there's going to be a physical shortage and and famine and rationing like usually happens. But again, this isn't dealing with physical things. This is dealing with spiritual things. And I think even you see it later in the book as John addresses this idea of the Christian's deprivation. In chapter 13, in verses 16 and 17, there's talk about this mark of the beast that comes up, and that's a whole nother issue. There are people who are faithful, who will not receive a mark on the hand or the forehead, who will not uh, join in the enemy's schemes and turn evil. Instead, they hold to God, and as such, they are left without the mark. But those without the mark are unable to trade or take part in the things of this world. As Christians keep on going, but as society keeps on declining, do not be surprised when we start to run into problems with the world. Christians back in the day were not able to trade with heathen peoples. They were cut out of society. They were made fun of. They were maligned and pushed aside. Do we really think it's going to be any different coming in the future? Maybe it's not here yet. Maybe it won't get that bad. But what happens when you start running out of life's necessities? Are you conquered by Christ? Or will you go over to the other side? As Christians, we cannot capitulate to the needs of the moment. As Christians, we cannot merely go along to get along. Christians stand for something bigger. Christians are gods, and as such, we cannot compromise, even if we should run into a lack. And ultimately, you see that most keenly in the fourth, as the ashen horse or the gray horse comes out as death comes to people. Again, I don't think this is death to just anyone and everyone, but the fifth seal talking about those martyred, those who are killed for the faith, this is death coming to Christians, taking it out on them physically, just like Stephen did in Acts chapter 7 as he stood for Christ and was killed for it, just like Paul did, unrecorded in here, but it's part of history as he stood for Christ and was executed, and Peter just like him. So many throughout the years have had to face a physical death as part of this. When death comes for you, who are you conquered by? Are you part of God's kingdom or are you part of the devil's? That's going to be made very, very clear. I don't know when. I don't know if all these things will play out in our lifetimes or if they're going to play out in the sequential order at all. But Jesus calls us, to go beyond just a, just a surface-level devotion to him, just coming to church on a Sunday. What happens when we start running out? 
what happens? Where do we turn to? Are we gods? Or are we going to capitulate to the devil? Jesus is allowing this. He's opening the seals. He's letting this happen because it separates the faithful from the unfaithful. And ultimately, you have a reckoning brought upon the world. It's going to sort the Christians from the non-Christians and those who believe and live it versus those who only say they believe. It's going to be hard to be a Christian. It is, and it will continue to be, and it will only get worse as this world gets worse because the gospel comes and the consequences follow. But you see the differences. You see the differences as you get into the responses of the two different groups. Verses 9 through 11 and verses 12 through 17. Here you have two different groups who are responding. You have the faithful martyrs who held to the end, and it didn't matter that they were starving, and it didn't matter that they were being persecuted. It doesn't matter that they died. They were faithful to God. You have all those people who capitulated, who did not starve, who lived in comfort, who were not persecuted on the earth, but ultimately in the end, they have to answer for that. There's a difference in these two different groups of people. And you see different things about these two groups. You see different things about the faithful and the evil. I'll just point out a few of those to you. When the Lamb breaks the fifth seal, John looks and behold, there is underneath the altar, there are the souls of those who have been slain. And we learn that faithful people are often killed for God. Why are they killed? Look at chapter 5, chapter, not chapter 5, chapter 6 and verse 9. Why are they killed? They're killed because they held to the word of God and to the testimony which they had maintained. Have we seen those two elements together before in Revelation? Look back at chapter 1. Chapter 1 in verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it to his angel, uh, by his angel, to his bondservant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Chapter 1 in verse 9, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of what? The word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And I looked under the altar and there were the souls of the slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony. Faithful people die for God. Faithful people suffer for God. Maybe it's a martyrdom that leaves them under the altar. Maybe it's just what John had. He wasn't killed. He was the only one of the apostles who escaped being killed. Instead, he's just exiled from all civilization to live a life until he just dies of old age. Christians suffer. Faithful people suffer for God. Not every example of faith is murdered, but a lot of them are. Are we made of the same stuff that they are? You notice that they're put under the altar, a sacrifice, if you will, to appease false gods. When evil arises in society, Christians are always the first to be cut out because we stand for something else. We stand for God's goodness, which will not be overrun by any evil nation. Instead, what they do is remove us and take us away and put us under the altar where we are with God. Because ultimately, that's the deliverance, isn't it? They're put under the altar, therefore humans can't hurt them anymore. And instead, from under the altar, they are not dead. They are very much alive. And from under the altar, they can call out for justice. Faithful people call to God for justice. Might I say they should call to God for justice. You see it here. You see it various places in the Old Testament prophets. You see it um, in, in the imprecatory Psalms as David prays for God to judge the enemies. And that's good. That is a proper thing. They call out to God in verse 10. How long, O Lord, you are holy and true. How long will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? That's a good question. That's a just question. That is a right question for them to ask. They're murdered for being righteous. God needs to do justice. And so they call out and they can ask him when he will. Faithful people have a line to God. They're able to just call him 
and they ask him to help them so long as they are willing to wait. Because it's all well and good to call to God for justice, but you have to have that balance. That faithful people are those who are willing to wait on God's time as they are under the altar, they are angry, they are calling out for judgment, and God gives them a white robe in verse 11, and he tells them to wait. He'll take care of it in the end, but he's got his time and he's got his plan. Sometimes we think that God is slow. Sometimes we think that God's not acting when he ought to. God is not slow as man counts slowness. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's got a plan and he's not going to shortcut it. But also, you notice what that plan involves in verse 11? Wait until your number is complete because there are still more who are going to have to suffer and die for the cause. It's part of being Christian. That's what you sign up for if you sign up. The four seals being conquered by Christ, facing these consequences, and even should we need to, dying for him. That's what the faithful are signing up for. But it's worth it in the end because it lets them avoid those consequences that the earth dwellers have to face. When God removes his people, when the faithful all die and only the evil are left, guess what? He comes in in judgment and he splits the world in verses 12 through 17. He rolls back the sky. He moves aside the mountains and you learn very valuable lessons about those who are on earth. And you realize you don't want to be them. These are things, these are facts that help the righteous to be patient, even when we're in trial and even when we're running into difficulty. Firstly, you learn that the evil ones will be exposed totally. The mountains are shifted aside. If God can shift aside the mountains, what can hide from him? He moves everything. He clears the table so that he can come in judgment. He pushes it all aside And now they have to answer to him. They try to hide. It's not going to go very well. It's not going to work for them. He's going to find them anyway because you cannot hide from God. Nothing is hidden that will not be revealed in the end. Secondly, then you learn that they are entirely judged and that there is no one, no evil that goes unseen. From the kings of the earth to the slaves of mankind, everyone is called out. In verse 15, you see the sequence as it goes from great to small. You have the kings of the earth, and you have the great men, and then the commanders, and the rich, and the strong, and and, and everyone. Slave or, or free, it doesn't matter. No one escapes the judgment of God, except the martyrs, already under the altar, already safe. They're in God's hands, and they're with him, but these earth dwellers have to go through it all. And thirdly, you see that these earth dwellers are terrified by the goodness of God. Better to be crushed under a mountain for all eternity than to face God as a sinner is their mindset. God's mere presence, the thing that we can look forward to, God's presence on the throne is enough to terrify them. They want a way, they want out, they don't want to be near God because he's so terrifying to them. By just existing, they just want a way. The lamb's wrath. Have you ever thought about that? Lambs don't get wrathful. And yet the wrath of the lamb is scaled back as it is, as restrained as it is, is too much for them to handle. And so fall on us, mountains and rocks. Fall on us, hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne. And from the wrath of the lamb, for their great day of their wrath has come. And who is able to stand? That's what you avoid by being one of the faithful ones. Now, does it look fun? Does it seem easy to avoid that? Well, no. You have to go through persecution. You have to go through trial. You have to go through death. But if it avoids that consequence, then does it not seem worth it to you? The fact is, when the gospel enters the world, it conquers those who have faith. It brings us to him and keeps us dedicated to him And you're going to have some physical consequences. And you're going to have some extra work as you lie under the altar, as you live on earth, long-suffering, and even after you're dead and gone. 
looking at the world and seeing how corrupt it is, waiting for that ultimate judgment day, you have to have patience, a dedication, a faith that God knows what he's doing, that Jesus is in control, that he's the one opening the seals and he will deal with it in his time. It's work. It's extra work that you sign up for when you're being a Christian, but it's worth it. Because at the end, there is a redemption. Start reading in chapter 7. This question about God's wrath, who can stand before it? Well, before we get the answer, there's a slight pause. Chapter 7 and verse 1. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. And Gad, 12,000. Asher, 12,000. Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed from each of them. And after these things, I looked. And behold, a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation, and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, These who are clothed in the white robes, who are they, and where have they come from? I said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones, what? Who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God. And they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. They will hunger no longer, nor thirst any more, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to the springs of the water of life. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Put in that perspective, is it worth being one of the ones who goes under the altar? You see a slight pause in verses 1 through 3. As we take a collective breath before the seventh seal is opened, almost as if to say nothing's going to be allowed to proceed further until God's people are secured. We're going to look out for them. We're going to make sure they're okay. In verse 2, there were angels to whom it is granted to harm the earth and the sea, and there's a command, stop, you don't do that until God's people are sealed and taken care of. Just because God lets us suffer doesn't mean he doesn't care. He's got a plan. It's all going to work in the end, but he lets us suffer and learn and work and grow and all with a hope to salvation, a salvation coming in the future that we don't get to see. We might not get to see it while it's on this earth, and yet it is coming. God sets a pause. He's going to take care of his people, and he does that in two parts because there were two different branches of his people in the first place. Firstly, you have the sealed, 144,000 people or 12 one-thousands for every tribe of Israel. This is a figurative number. To emphasize the point he's getting across, and it's a, really a figurative list of the tribes, to emphasize the point he's getting across. When you look at these 12 tribes, when you list out the 12 tribes of Israel, these don't align with them. When you list out the 12 sons of Israel, these don't align with them either. Why? Because it's not about the literal Israel. It's about the point that he's getting across. It's a point of faithfulness. And I'll explain that as you look at the differences. Firstly, you see Joseph and not Ephraim. That shouldn't be the case in verse 8. Why is it Joseph and why is there no Ephraim who's named instead? There's Manasseh. 
It's not Ephraim. Why? Why the difference there? When Jacob claimed, uh, when Jacob met Joseph in the end of Genesis, he essentially disowns Joseph and takes Ephraim and Manasseh as his direct children. He says so. And then every time from then on, when you name the 12 tribes, there is no Joseph. It's Ephraim and Manasseh. And there is no Levi because Levi never inherits the land. Here you have Joseph, not Ephraim. Here you have Levi, even though they didn't inherit. And here you never have Dan mentioned. They're just removed entirely. Maybe it's because the point is a point about faithfulness that's found in the people. Levi is a tribe of priests. They're inherently connected to God. Dan in Judges 17 and 18 walked away from God entirely. Instead of settling in the land that God had given them, they went somewhere else, committed acts of idolatry, murdered an innocent village, and settled wherever they wanted to. They're not included. They weren't faithful to God. Ephraim is much the same way, connected with idolatry. In 1 Kings eleven twenty six, 26, it identifies Jeroboam, the first king in the divided kingdom of Israel. He's from Ephraim. And there he builds his city. He builds his capital city in Shechem in 1 Kings 12, 25, and immediately sets up idols and leads the rest of Israel away from God for the rest of history. Ephraim is associated with idolatry. There is no idolatry within the people of God. It's only the people of faith. Because, let's face it, the old covenant did save some. God made a covenant with people of Israel back in the day. Before the new covenant, but before that was ever established, we had Abraham and Moses and David and so many more. Faithful people, not Christians, but faithful to God, and he promised he would save them even before Jesus came. Jesus comes and his death, his blood seals that forever, and thus he saves them. He saves some from Israel. But more important than that is that listing of the saved that takes up the rest of the end of the chapter. The saved, which when you compare these new covenant people with the old covenant, in verses 4 through 8, you see how much better the new covenant is. If God saves the old covenant, won't he save the people in the new? And you see this comparison of how much better it is. These ones in verse 9 are infinite. No longer limited to 144,000, they're a multitude that you can't even count. And there's no, no getting around that. There is no cap on how many can enter God's presence. In the new covenant, anyone is invited in to stay. These ones are before God, not on the earth. Israel was sealed on the earth. Christians are sealed in heaven, are living there even right now. Ephesians talks about that. The new Testament is a spiritual one. We talked about in Hebrews 12 a couple of weeks ago now, that the Old Testament was very focused on those physical things, a physical temple, a physical city, a physical kingdom of its own, and physical sacrifices that covered the sins of the people. The New Testament, it's all in heaven. None of that physical stuff, and thus we are before God instead of being stuck on earth. Thirdly, these are people from every nation and tribe and tongue that you can imagine. Not restricted to just the Jews and just one ethnicity, we don't have to be Jewish to be Christian. We now just have to be faithful. Anyone who wants to join God is perfectly able to do so. Number four, these are the people identified in verse nine as those, the answer to the great question in chapter six and verse 17. Here's the wrath of God. Who is able to stand before it? Those who have dipped their robes in the blood of the lamb and made them white. In verse 9, they're standing before the throne. They're the ones who are standing before the Lamb, able to stand in front of God because Jesus has authorized them to do so. And ultimately, we see this group of people, the Christians, the New Covenant faithful. These are the people with direct access to God. No blockage, no barrier. When the elder asks John, in verse 13, he asks, who are these people? John says, do you know better than I do? And the elder explains, these are the people who have washed their, their robes in the blood of the Lamb. These are the people who have been purified. These are the people of God's faithful ones, and they're before God's throne, and there they get to serve him. 
right in front of his throne. They serve him. He spreads his tabernacle over them directly. He's with them right there. He's with his faithful ones, no longer a degree of separation, but we are in his very presence. Sing a song sometimes, no tears in heaven. It's not because heaven is great and perfect and happy all the time. It's because God is there to wipe every tear from their eyes directly. It's a direct relationship. And sure, there's no sorrow. That's addressed in a few chapters later on. But God is there. He is with them personally. He takes personal interest and time in every single one of the faithful ones. When you end chapter 17, chapter 7, not chapter 17, my bad. When you, end, when you look in chapter 6, it's all a picture of these horrible things that are happening when you end chapter 7, it's a picture of God waiting for his own to come to live with him. And that's a picture worth looking forward to. Life is bad, and it's always getting worse. And it's going to be rough any, any day that you're here, any time you have to deal with the people here. God made the world perfect, and we messed it up. And there is nothing that fixes that. No, instead, God lets it run for a while, and then he'll step in and take care of it. While this world is running, the Christians will run into problems and lack and, and be unable to provide for themselves, run into death and martyrdom, sometimes different persecutions, casting us around, throwing us place to place. The question is, where is your hope? Is there hope in this world? It shouldn't be. It'll be removed and taken around, and it'll take you away from God. Or you can hope in heaven, and even though you suffer in this life, you'll be taken care of in the next. There's war on earth. There is no war in heaven. There's a lack of resources on earth. Why do you think it says they will hunger no more in heaven? You might lose your home. You might lose your shelter. You might be taken to a place that you don't want to go. Guess what? In heaven, there's a tabernacle that God spreads over you personally. He takes care of you. And he will do it in his time. Life on earth is always getting worse. And so we live for a life in heaven. It's not about this world. Don't dedicate yourself to this. Be conquered by Christ and belong to him. Hopefully there's something there for you to think about as you go through this life. It's a tough one. It's distracting. It takes us away from God at all the most inopportune times. And yet he promises us something better. There's a fountain free. And it's waiting for you if you're willing to come and drink from it.